uh, hello friends myself dr harmeet goel i have done my mbbs from lady harding medical college and post graduation in hobs dyni from bmmc subdarjan hospital delhi today i am going to discuss the aims pg june 2020 hobs dyni questions so let us just start with the discussion the first question is all of the following are the components of biophysical profile except okay so the options given are nst that is non stress test fetal breathing movements gross body movements and contraction stress test well biophysical profile biophysical profile also known as manning's score the other name for biophysical profile is manning's score in the manning score the radiologist does the ultrasound and it is done in high risk pregnancies high risk pregnancies like pregnancy induced hypertension post dated pregnancy iugr chronic hypertension and diabetes in pregnancy so the radiologist check the five different fetal parameters that is nst which is non stress test that means relationship of fetal heart rate to fetal movements normally the fetal heart rate is 110 to 160 beats per minute less than 110 is called as fetal bradycardia more than 160 is called as fetal tachycardia so both means fetal distress there are other components in the non stress test the non stress test is a test for fetal well being which can be studied by the nst machine which can be studied by nst machine or it can be done by the ultrasound another important component in manning score is the amniotic fluid index the abdomen of the pregnant lady is divided into four quadrants and the liker pockets are been checked another component is the fetal tone so the observation is done over 20 minutes time and normally the fetus is in flexed attitude so from flexion to extension and back to flexion this is what is called as fetal tone there has to be one movement of fetal tone in 20 minutes time then another component is gross body movement okay two three discrete limb movements of the baby on ultrasound then another one is the fetal breathing movements so there are five parameters that is non stress test the non stress test amniotic fluid fetal tone gross body movement and the fetal breathing movements to each parameter the score is given to so normal scoring the normal scoring is 10 by 10 that means fetus is all right so contraction stress test is not included in the biophysical profile so nst is included fetal breathing movements cross body movements the fetal tone and amniotic fluid now there was another question which was asked in the previous one of the previous aims pg exam and that was what is modified biophysical profile modified biophysical profile when nst and amniotic fluid index only two parameters are used that is called as modified biophysical profile 
fine so we move on to the next important question that is which is not the mechanism of action of ocps now oral contraceptive pills that means a combination of combination of estrogen and progesterone combination of estrogen and progesterone so the combined ocps as it contains estrogen plus progesterone so they cause a negative feedback inhibition at the level of pituitary estrogen reduces the release of fsh and progesterone <clears throat> reduces the release of lh if fsh lh is down then from the ovaries the maturation of the graafian follicles and form formation of the dominant follicle is been affected plus when there is no dominant follicle there will not be any ovulation so the main mechanism of action of ocps is suppression of ovulation also the progesterone component in the ocps they make the cervical mucus thick and scanty so reduces the entry of sperms another mechanism of action of combined ocps is that the estrogen and progesterone in the combined ocps they cause endometrial changes so making the environment unfavorable for implantation so the answer to this question is that the ocps which contains estrogen progesterone they do not have any effect on the gnrh gnrh gonadotropin releasing hormone now we move on to the next question which is which is not a component of bishop score bishop score bishop score is a scoring for cervix and bishop score is used for checking the various five components okay before you plan the induction of labor or you have to augment the labor okay so it is the status status of the cervix it is the status of the cervix so the components in the bishop score include cervical dilatation cervical length position of the cervix consistency of the cervix and station of the presenting part station of the presenting part so maternal pelvis is not included in the bishop's score there are two things in the where you have to understand there is bishop score and there is who modified bishop score who modified bishop score what is the difference in the bishop score there is cervical dilatation there is cervical effacement there is consistency of the cervix there is position of the cervix and there is station of fetal presenting part so all the things are same in who modified bishop score only thing is instead of effacement they use the term cervical length so not normally there are numbers given to the each component 
and normal score is 6 to 13. So depending upon the bishop score, we have to decide that we can allow the spontaneous labor to proceed or we have to do induction of labor or augmentation of labor. So in this question, the type of the maternal pelvis is the answer which you should rule out. So bishop score includes dilatation of the cervix, cervical length and position. And rest are station of the presenting part and consistency of the cervix. Now we move on to the next question. Which is the criteria for abdominal ectopic pregnancy? Which is the criteria for abdominal ectopic pregnancy? Now, abdominal ectopic pregnancy, the Spiegelberg criteria is basically used for pregnancy occurring in the ovary. So, ovarian ectopic pregnancy. Ovarian ectopic pregnancy. Study food is the criteria for primary abdominal ectopic pregnancy and Rubin's criteria is used for cervical ectopic pregnancy. So in the JIPMER PG exam 2018, they have asked about the Spiegelberg criteria. So Spiegelberg criteria is for ovarian ectopic and in this AIMS PG, they have asked study four criteria, which is for primary abdominal ectopic pregnancy. Fine. So in the study four criteria, study four criteria, it says that the fallopian tube and ovaries should be normal. Number two, there is there is no secondary implantation and there is no utero placental fistula. Study four criteria is fallopian tube and ovaries of both the sides should be normal. There should not be any secondary implantation and there should not be utero-placental fistula. So primary, primary abdominal ectopic pregnancy. It is absolutely rare and many of the textbooks and articles say this condition usually does not exist. Now, we move on to the next question that is a 50-year-old female presents with abnormal vaginal bleeding for two months and management will be. First of all, 50-year-old female. This is in the perimenopausal age group or you can say this is postmenopausal female which is presented with abnormal vaginal bleeding, okay? So any vaginal bleeding above the age of 40 should be taken up very, very seriously, okay? So in this case, all the article says that we should investigate because in this perimenopausal age group, the chance of malignancies are high. So we want to know the nature of the bleeding. So in this case, we cannot start the progesterone therapy because what we do not know what is the cause. Hysterectomy is not the treatment. Okay. And LNG IUCD, levonorgestrel IUCD, we cannot insert unless until we have a proper diagnosis. Okay. So in this question, we have to select the option as endometrial aspiration 
cytology or the curettage. Okay. So, friends, if there is abnormal bleeding above the age of 40 or you can say 45, for example, six months of bleeding, which is pattern is abnormal. So always the DNC or endometrial biopsy or endometrial aspiration biopsy should be done to rule out the malignancy. Or if there is a history of unopposed estrogen, that is so much of the estrogen exposure, like if there is PCOD patient, where there is unopposed estrogen exposure or there is endometrial hyperplasia, then always to know the nature of the uterine pathology, the biopsy should be done first before you plan any treatment. Next. Must needed screening for cancer cervix in. So, Always the screening for cancer cervix should be started at 21 years of age, but mind it in a sexually active female. Sexually active female and pap smear should be repeated every three yearly till the age of the female is 30 years then it should be repeated if it is coming negative it should be repeated every five yearly and it is recommended that we can go for HPV testing along with that and this should be done every five yearly till the age of the female is 60 to 65 years and then stop. So pap smear screening or the screening for cancer cervix. Pap smear is a secondary level of prevention. So pap smear screening is not recommended in less than 21 years of age and starting age is 21. Less than 21, it is not recommended. After 30 years of age, again, this option we should rule out. After 65 years, no testing is needed because cancer cervix, there is a bimodal age uh, exposure which has been seen. One age exposure according to the cancer textbook NOVAC is around 30 to 35 years, another peak is seen at 60 to 65 years of age. So it is of no use if you are doing it after 65 years. So the correct answer to this question is 21 to 65 years of age. The screening of cancer cervix by the pap smear is being recommended. And nowadays the cytology is being done by the liquid-based cytology, which is liquid PAPS, which value is much better. The result is much better interpretation than the conventional PAPS we were doing for many years. Now we move on to the next question. That is, a 30-year-old female was diagnosed with unilateral breast cancer. She was put on tamoxifen, risk of which of the following has been increased. Now, tamoxifen. Tamoxifen we know tamoxifen is estrogen receptor modulator. This is estrogen receptor modulator. Okay. And tamoxifen is being prescribed in the patients of breast cancer after surgery has been done or after they have received radiotherapy or chemotherapy. So idea of giving tamoxifen is 
to prevent the recurrence of breast cancer but it is seen and it is observed that if the tamoxifen is been given in the cases of breast cancer the risk of endometrial cancer is been increased so let's just quickly go through the risk factors for cancer endometrium risk factors for cancer endometrium includes nulliparity infertility hormonal replacement therapy polycystic ovarian disease endometrial hyperplasia early menarche and late menopause obesity diabetes hypertension feminizing ovarian tumors feminizing ovarian tumors that is granulosa cell thicker cell tamoxifen and there is lynch to syndrome patients lynch to syndrome patients okay lynch to syndrome patients hnpcc that is hereditary non polyposis colorectal cancer syndrome so you see tamoxifen is an important risk factor for endometrial cancer so in this question tamoxifen do not increase the incidence of ovarian cancer it does not increase the chance for ovarian cancer does not increase the chance for cml so it increases the risk for endometrial cancer here uh, wrongly uh, one of the option has been added the option was increase the chance for contralateral breast cancer Uh, there is a little bit mistake so the options were increase incidence of ovarian cancer increase chance of contralateral breast cancer increase risk of endometrial cancer and cml so it does not increase the risk for contralateral breast cancer does not increase the risk for ovarian cancer does not increase the risk of cml it increases the risk for endometrial cancer so i move on to the next question 28 year old female g2 p1 that is gravida 2 and para 1 with 8 months amenorrhea presented with pain abdomen bleeding per vaginum loss of fetal movements history of pih on medication diagnosis in this question this is her second pregnancy and she presented with 8 months amenorrhea there is pain abdomen there is vaginal bleeding and loss of fetal movements and she has history of hypertension or pregnancy induced hypertension now in this case there is amenorrhea 8 months that means it is third trimester she presented with pain abdomen and she presented with bleeding amenorrhea that is third trimester third trimester bleeding so it has to be aph antepartum hemorrhage now is it placenta previa or is it abruptio placentae let's just see amenorrhea pain abdomen and bleeding in case of placenta previa there is not the pain plus pih there is no direct relation with the placenta previa whereas pih there is vasoconstriction and there is premature separation of a normally situated placenta premature separation of a normally situated placenta so there is internal bleed okay so that means this patient has bled so much internally and the vitals is not been given in the option so the loss of the fetal movements has 
occurred. That means she must have lost more than one liter of blood. That is why there is loss of the fetal movements. That baby has become dead. So polyhydramnios never presents with such a history. Preterm labor pains. Why there will be loss of the fetal movements, which has not been explained in this case. So this is a clear cut case of accidental hemorrhage, which is abruptio placentae. Next question. 28 year old female presents with six weeks amenorrhea, pain abdomen, bleeding per vaginum, UPT that is urine pregnancy test positive and transvaginal scan shows empty uterus, no free fluid in the pouch of Douglas, ovary normal, next line of management. In this case, that first of all, there is a history of six weeks amenorrhea, pain, abdomen, bleeding. So amenorrhea, pain, abdomen, bleeding in the first trimester. It may be ectopic pregnancy. That is one possibility. Urine pregnancy test is positive and transvaginal scan shows that there is empty uterus. That means no gestation sac in the uterus, but there is no free fluid in the pouch of Douglas and ovary is normal. What is the next line of management? So we cannot plan a laparoscopy because we have not been able to make a diagnosis in this case. Okay. Unless until we are very, very sure about the diagnosis here, it is not written that there is some conceptus in the uterus. So what we are going to evacuate. Okay. Hospitalize and keep under observation. Again, I am not in favor of. There can be two possibilities in this case. Number one, empty uterus on TVS, which goes in favor of ectopic pregnancy. Number two, it may be intrauterine pregnancy, but in the process of abortion. That is why there is empty uterus and at six weeks, they are not able to comment whether there is a gestation sac in the uterus or not. So I would like to go in favor of why not get a beta HCG done and see the report because in this question again the condition of the patient appears to be stable so we have time to go for the beta hcg if the beta hcg value comes out to be more than 1500 milli international units per ml this will go in favor of ectopic pregnancy that is depending upon the transvaginal ultrasound report and combining it with, with beta hcg if this goes less than 1500 milli international units per ml, then it may be in the process of abortion. So among the two, the deciding factor will be follow up with beta HCG To confirm our diagnosis, to come to a conclusion, accordingly we have to plan the management. Whether it is ectopic pregnancy, which is not ruptured, or whether it is abortion, if it is abortion, depending upon the beta HCG value, and later on we can get a repeat ultrasound done also just to confirm and correlate the values, then we can evac the uterus. If it is ectopic pregnancy, depending upon the value of the beta HCG and the TBS, and after 48 hours, if we see the value has been increasing, we can go by that, or we can give a medical treatment, or we can plan the laparoscopy and go for the salpingostomy. It will depend upon further the mode of the investigation, where it signifies and which direction it is moving. Next, ESR increase in pregnancy because of increase in. You see that in pregnancy, there is total protein synthesis which is increased and plasma proteins are decreased because its utilization is faster. Fine. Platelets, there is gestational thrombocytopenia and albumin to globulin ratio is reversed. Normally, albumin to globulin ratio is 1.7 is to 1. So in pregnancy, it will reduce to 1 is to 1 because 
albumin is a main binding proteins for various hormones and its utilization is fast so we see in the clotting system that factor 11 and 13 are decreased rest all clotting factors increase in pregnancy so is the serum fibrinogen levels increases in pregnancy up to 50% and pregnancy is hypercoagulable state so esr increases which is correlating because the serum fibrinogen levels is increased in pregnancy fine next why we are not marking the albumin and other factors because there is decrease in the pregnancy next 38 year old lady presented in the gynae opd with cytology report showing hsil next step in the management cytology pap smear always there is a question either they are asking colposcopy or they are asking pap smear report sometimes what is the next step in management something they write the cin3 which is cervical intraepithelial neoplasia type 3 it is positive what is your next step in management so obviously there is in the neat pg or in the aims pg definitely there is a question on this so hsin that is high grade squamous intraepithelial neoplasia okay high grade squamous intraepithelial neoplasia on the cytology cytology means the pap smear report you know there are two types of cancer in the cancer cervix the most common is the squamous cell carcinoma which arises from the lip of the cervix that is squamous columnar junction another one is the adenocarcinoma which is occurring in the cervical canal so if the pap smear report shows hsil always always pap smear is always a screening test pap smear always is a screening test and we need to confirm the report before we offer any treatment so age of the patient whether it is 35 whether it is 40 and all the straight away depending upon the screening test report we can never offer any treatment we have to confirm it first so always the hsl report it needs to be confirmed on colposcopy colposcopy is a three dimensional study where you aim at aim at visualizing the transformation zone okay and we apply 3 to 5% acetic acid and abnormal area appears acetoite because the abnormal cells contains the abnormal proteins which get precipitated so it depends colposcopy has another advantage that simultaneously you can recognize the area you can visualize the area where there is a suspicion of malignancy or not you can take the biopsy accordingly so we i am not in favor of repeat pap smear i am not in favor of hysterectomy because it is just a screening test which has shown hsil cryo surgery again i am not in favor so the answer to this question straight away goes for colposcopy if in the exam for example there was a previous aims pg exam where they have written cin 3 positive patient but this time they have written on colposcopic directed biopsy and the age of the patient was given 35 year so there was one of the previous question of aims where it has written that there is a 35 year old female patient with para 3 l3 that means the family is complete but she she is cin3 positive on colposcopic directed biopsy what is your next step in management so here in that question they have already confirmed that cin3 is a report on colposcopic directed biopsy that means they have already confirmed it so the best management in that case will be the leap leap is low electrosurgical excision procedure where there is a leap instrument and there is a low voltage blended current is used to excise the transformation zone so again in nutshell if there is a finding like cin2 cin3 on pap smear 
the next step will not be the treatment it will be the colposcopy and if they write cin3 on colposcopy then your management is you give the treatment and the best treatment possible for cin3 is le that is loop electrosurgical excision procedure moving on to the next question that is 24 year old female presents with 6 weeks amenorrhea intractable vomiting ultrasound shows snowstorm appearance the next step in management now in this case there is a clear cut history 6 weeks amenorrhea intractable vomiting means excessive vomiting and ultrasound shows no storm appearance ultrasound is the investigation of choice for h molar pregnancy and you see a snow storm appearance okay so in h molar pregnancy there is amenorrhea there is bleeding bleeding is not written in this case there may be features of thyrotoxicosis there may be features of pis there may be features of hyperemesis gravidarum here they have given 6 weeks amenorrhea and there is intractable vomiting that is so much of vomiting and clearly they have written that ultrasound shows no storm appearance so it's a clear cut case of h molar pregnancy so when they have already given you a confirmed or investigation of choice has already been done which is ultrasound so you have to give straight away the management okay no role of conservative management no role of medical management okay there is no role of beta hcg beta hcg here we will be using it for follow up but not as managing this case this patient straight away requires the treatment and the age of the patient is young so we will go for suction evacuation so h molar pregnancy in this question is already given a confirmed case if the age of the female is young then we go for suction evacuation followed by curettage in the same setting important step to be noted here is that we usually use a white bore cannula number 2 if any oxytocin drip you want to start it should be started on the ot table itself not in the labor room or the ward okay because it can lead to emboli formation and that can block various vessels or the respiratory passages so if you want to start any oxytocin drip if the size of the uterus was given more then we will always start on the ot table one more thing here it is just a 6 weeks pregnancy but any h molar pregnancy you are evacuating always always remember that adequate blood or one unit of blood should be arranged because the most common complication of h molar pregnancy evacuation is the bleeding so that should be always taken into consideration if the age of the female is uh, say above 40 years or above 35 years and her family is complete or she belongs to high risk then the preferred management would have been the hysterectomy in that case in this case the age of the patient is young and it's a clear cut case of a molar pregnancy so we go for suction evacuation and after suction evacuation we have to keep the 6 months follow up with the beta hcg next question all are used in the treatment of pcos except polycystic ovarian syndrome so polycystic ovarian disease is one of the important causes of infertility nowadays and it is the most treatable cause of infertility or most reversible cause of infertility because in pcos there is an ovulation and you have to basically give the drug to treat the an ovulation so in this case let us see the option one after the another clomiphene citrate clomiphene citrate is anti estrogen clomiphene citrate is anti estrogen what is happening in pcod patient i just want to add just few points in this pcod patient there is hyper estrogenism hyper estrogenism there is hyper androgenism there is 
and ovulation, there is hyperinsulinemia. So in this case, PCOD, there is hyperestrogenism, hyperandrogenism, anovulation, hyperinsulinemia, and progesterone deficiency. So clomiphen citrate is anti-estrogen. Let us just see how it works. Now, in PCOD patients, there is FSH which is down and LH is very high. So, there is high levels of estrogen which is causing a negative feedback inhibition at the level of pituitary. So, FSH is down. And when FSH is down, ovary is not stimulated. So, there is no dominant follicle and there is no ovulation. Estrogen inhibits the release of FSH, but it stimulates the release of LH. So when you're giving clomiphene citrate, clomiphene citrate is anti-estrogen. So clomiphene citrate binds to the estrogen receptors and it inhibits the negative feedback caused by high levels of estrogen. So it causes rise in FSH, and also normalizes the LH levels. So automatically the follicles of the ovary start forming and ovulation occurs. So clomiphene is the drug for PCOD to treat an ovulation. Latrozole. Latrozole has shown very, very promising results in the recent times. Latrozole is aromatase enzyme inhibitor. Aromatase enzyme inhibitor. And it is also a very important drug nowadays, which has been used in PCOD patients. And it has got less side effects than clomiphene citrate. So, latrozole is also used. It is used in fibroid uterus also. Latrozole is also used in PCOD cases to bring out the ovulation. Another one. If there is an infertility case and in infertility case you have done laparoscopy and to rule out any endometriosis or in cases of unexplained infertility and you find there are polycystic ovaries so sometimes ovarian drilling is done how does ovarian drilling work ovarian drilling leads to the leakage of the fluid which has been collected in the polycystic ovaries and this fluid is usually rich in androgens which is causing the problems. So laparoscopic ovarian drilling once upon the time it was also done but always when you're treating a patient of PCOD always we go for the medical treatment first but ovarian drilling laparoscopically is also being done whereas ulipristal Uli crystal has got no role in PCOD patients. What is Uli crystal? Uli crystal. Uli crystal is selective progesterone receptor modulator. It is selective progesterone receptor modulator. So, ulipristal is being used as emergency contraception. And in the AIMS PG 2018, it was asked that dose of ulipristal in emergency contraception, so it is 30 milligram dose. Another use of ulipristal apart from emergency contraception is the fibroid uterus. So there are two important uses of Uli crystal, that is the emergency contraception or the post coital contraception and the fibroid. So in this question, clomiphene citrate you give for PCOD, latrozole you give for PCOD, laparoscopic ovarian drilling can also be done for PCOS cases, but Uli crystal has got no role. Next, 32 year old female presented with infertility 
in the infertility clinic she has regular cycles of 28 days and ovulation can be confirmed with in this question they have written she has she has regular cycles of 28 days she has regular cycles of 28 days so in this case let me just mention there are various tests that we do for ovulation there are some of the old tests like basal body temperature cervical mucus method premenstrual endometrial biopsy and you see secretory endometrium nowadays the preferred one is transvaginal scan that is what is called as ultrasound follicular monitoring where the radiologist time to time call the uh, lady for an ultrasound and they observe over a period of time the dominant follicle size of the dominant follicle on transvaginal scan 18 to 20 mm and suppose it is 12th day or 13th day next day what he finds that there is shrinkage in the size of the dominant follicle plus free fluid in the pouch of douglas that is how they give you the report for ovulation studies so transvaginal scan is one of the important tool or most importantly done investigation for ovulation studies apart from this we can also get serum progesterone levels done on day 21 how do we count the days first day of the periods is called as day 1 of the cycle so day 21 serum progesterone levels are done and its value more than 15 nanograms per ml is confirmatory for ovulation so in this case they have already written 28 days so straight away our answer is progesterone levels done on 21 day so what are the tests for ovulation basal body temperature cervical mucus method premenstrual endometrial biopsy transvaginal scan and serum progesterone now what about the what about the lh levels so lh levels there are lh level kits available which is the urinary kits and it is been recommended in those patients who have irregular cycles okay many of the pcod patients or infertility cases their cycles are very very irregular so how do we count the days so if the patient has been prepared for iui or that is intra uterine insemination artificial insemination cycles then lh kits can be used as a predictor for ovulation okay otherwise in the regular cycles it is the serum progesterone levels which can be checked on 21 day now all structures are cut in mediolateral in mediolateral episiotomy except so most commonly given episiotomy nowadays is the mediolateral episiotomy episiotomy there are different types of episiotomy first of all episiotomy is called as second degree perineal tear and we give the local anesthesia at the site of incision there are different types of episiotomy like median episiotomy mediolateral episiotomy lateral episiotomy and j shaped episiotomy out of them the mediolateral episiotomy mediolateral episiotomy is the most safest and most commonly used the advantage is that extension to rectum is rare so median episiotomy previously was given but now it is outdated because extension to rectum is common in this case so what are the structures that are cut in mediolateral episiotomy the structures that are cut in mediolateral episiotomy includes the posterior vaginal wall the bulbospongiosus muscle superficial and deep transverse perineal vessels pudendal vessels and nerves then the skin and the subcutaneous perineal tissue but obturator muscle is not been cut so this is a very very simple and basic question so what are the structures that are cut in the mediolateral episiotomy that is posterior vaginal wall the bulbospongiosus muscle the superficial and deep transverse perineal muscles the pudendal vessels and nerves the skin and the subcutaneous 
tissue, but the obturator muscle is not been cut. Now, 45 year old multiparous women incidentally diagnosed clinically with 14 weeks size fibroid, but she is asymptomatic. What is the next line of management? Here, important thing is the asymptomatic patient. One more thing. Another thing is they have given you the age group. 45. She is in premenopausal age group. Very soon, uh, she is going to approach the menopause. So size 14 weeks is just written to confuse the students. But here, two things you have to see. 45 year, multiparous lady. Number two, she is asymptomatic patient. Fine. So are you going to plan myomectomy? No. Myomectomy is recommended mostly in the reproductive age group where it is either submucosal fibroid, which is causing infertility or it is causing recurrent abortions. Then the hysteroscopic guided myomectomy is recommended. Or there is subserous fibroid where the size is more, so laparoscopically that can be removed. Or there are multiple fibroids, we can go for myomectomy. So here, this is not the case. Number two, when she is asymptomatic, why to opt for hysterectomy? In near future, she can approach the menopause. And one of the main important components during the reproductive years, it is the estrogen which helps in the growth of the fiber. Once she attains menopause, the ovarian function will be down, estrogen will be down. That will lead to shrinkage of the size of the fiber. So why to expose her for a surgical complication? Now medical treatment. For what? She is not complaining. This was diagnosed, incidentally diagnosed. Okay, so I am in favor of expectant management, just the observation or the conservative management in this case. Now, there is a guideline that asymptomatic fibroid patient, when you should think of treating. Number one, when asymptomatic fibroid is leading to somewhat like it is causing infertility or it is causing habitual abortions then you should think of removing then if it is causing the pressure symptoms then you can think of removing or it is causing like there is sudden increase in the size of fibroid where you suspect some malignancy although the chance of malignancy or the sarcomatous change in the fibroid is just 0.5 percent but if there is a sudden increase in the size of the fibroid then you think of taking a step surgically removing or if the diagnosis and all that is uncertain Okay, so in that scenario, you can think of removing the fiber. So that's all.